Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to all of you here in Malaysia and a very good morning to our participants in the UK. Hope everyone is keeping uh, safe and managing well. I'm Jennifer, the Chief Executive of the British Malaysian Chamber of Commerce, the BMCC. Welcome to the BMCC Energy Outlook 2021, charting a new path towards sustainability. The, the, and we are pleased to say this webinar is supported by the British High Commission Kuala Lumpur. We are honoured today to have with us uh, the Honourable Deputy Minister of Energy and Natural Resources Malaysia, YB Dato Ali Biju. Welcome, YB. We are also honoured to have with us Mr. Ken O'Farrity, the UK Government's COP26 Regional Ambassador to Asia Pacific and South Asia. Thank you, YB and Ken, for joining us. I would also like to welcome uh, Mr. Hanif Hashim, our chairman for the BMCC Energy Committee, who is also the board member of BMCC and in his full-time role as the senior vice president of Petrofac Malaysia. Hi, Hanif. This afternoon, joining uh, YB and uh, Ken has our distinguished panel of speakers, uh, Dr. Jason Mariapan, the head of New Energy Petronas, Mr. Azman Az Nasir, the Regional Director of Asia Pacific of the New Energy Industries Council, EIC, and Mr. Leon, uh, Dr. Leon Rosario, a ASEAN Technical and Marketing Director of Ricardo Asia Limited UK, who will moderate our Q&A session. Thank you everyone for joining. So, um, this technical issue. I'm pleased to share that today's webinar is part of the March webinar series for Great is Sustainable Future. It's a, um, you know, our UK government's great campaign looking to achieve a net zero, net zero future. The webinar series is one of the various initiatives as a run up to COP26 hosted by the UK in November. I would like to thank our colleagues in the British High Commission for this collaboration. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take a few minutes to share about BMCC. And uh, BMCC, has, uh, those of you who are not aware, has been established since 1963, has served as a catalyst for shared business platform for both British and Malaysian companies. After more than five decades, we continue to continue our mandate of fostering bilateral trade between UK and Malaysia by, by doing so by providing businesses with B2B networking opportunities, including now on digital platforms, previously very much face-to-face. -face. Hopefully, we will go back to face-to-face -face soon. Supporting our members um, yeah, supporting our members in profiling their best practices, best practices and services through branding and profiling, facilitating industry voice for members in engaging uh, government and policy makers, as well as offering our support, especially for UK businesses to expand in Malaysia by promoting Malaysia as a preferred destination for trade and investment in the region. Member committees such as the Energy Committee that is spearheading today's program is a platform for members of the same sector to network, exchange information, identify opportunities, share best practices like today's session that we are having. Committees also support the Chamber's advocacy role in engaging government and policy makers on matters affecting the sector and profession. So I will not share so much about committees. I'm uh, Hanif, our chairman is here today. He will be sharing more shortly. So ladies and gentlemen, um, despite, despite an urgent need for a reduction, global greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise in demonstrating that even more ambitious efforts is required to achieve net zero targets. Renewable energies play, renewable energy plays a key role for that matter. While we have become a mainstream energy, there is much to be done. The good news, I would say, is that energy transition is gaining more importance and already at the top agenda of many leading organizations in the oil and gas sector, as well as governments today. So we look forward to hearing more of these efforts by both government and private sector 
as well as what needs to be done from our esteemed speakers. As a chamber, BMCC is very pleased to be working with our members, colleagues at the High Commission, as well as government Malaysian stakeholders such as the Malaysian Green Tech Corporation on initiatives to exchange best practices, promote best practices in production solution collaboration between UK and Malaysia to promote and stimulate renewable energy sector in Malaysia. So with the Honourable Minister here, we look forward to collaborate YB with your ministry to support Malaysia's plans. With that, I would like to invite Hanif the Chairman of the Energy Committee to, to, to say a few words. Hanif, over to you. Can you hear me? Yes, I okay. can. Look, uh, the Honorable Dato Ali Biju, Deputy Minister, Minister of Energy and Natural Resources, uh, Malaysia. Jennifer, Miss Jennifer Lopez, the person which gave a short opening remark just now. Jennifer is the Chief Executive Director of BMCC. My fellow BMCC Energy Committee members, members of the BMCC, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. So good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum uh, to all. Now, as chairman of the BMCC Energy Committee and as the BMCC, as a BMCC board member, I wish to extend our special thanks to our supporting partner, the British High Commission in Kuala Lumpur, because they have been giving us continuous support for events like the one that we're going to have, that we are having today. Now, I would like to also thank you to the Honorable Datu Ali Biju as well and all the invited speakers today from the UK government, from Petronas, from EIC or Energy Industries Council, and also from Ricardo Asia for spending their valuable time today to share with all of us their views, insights, and opinions about how the industry landscape would look like now in the medium term and also in the long run. Now, before we hear all the interesting insights, views, opinions from the uh, esteemed speakers uh, shortly later on, allow me please to share with all of you a bit about BMCC Energy Committee. Now, the Energy Committee, since its inception in 2017, we serve as a principal platform upon which partnerships and collaborations are formed between the UK and Malaysia, between the UK and Malaysia in the energy sector. Now, rather than calling the committee, the oil and gas committee, we call ourselves the energy committee. The reason behind that is simple. We have companies who deals with oil and gas uh, industry or the fossil fuel industry. At the same time, we also have uh, members who represent new type of energies, renewables, greens, energy transition. So on that basis, four years ago, we call ourselves the Energy Committee, which I think is the right uh, nomenclature to be used. Now, the committee was launched, like I said, four years ago. It was launched by the previous uh, ambassador or high commissioner to Malaysia, which is the Her Excellency Vicky Trudell, and with the presence of the Executive Vice President of Petronas, which is NG Atif Tukifli. Now, the committee's key objectives for everybody's info includes fostering better relationship between UK and Malaysia, Malaysian companies. We firmly believe good relationship makes good business. That's what we want to do. At the same time, we try our best to introduce new innovative technologies and solutions which Malaysia require and vice versa. And at the same time, since we represent companies from the UK, we have a comprehensive database of Malaysian British companies involved in the energy sector. Now to share with you some of the initiative that we have done so far, and we try our best to make sure that the stature of our events are you know, one notch higher compared to the other type of events that other people does or other people do. For example, we have roundtables with the right uh, 
uh, participation. For example, we have roundtables with the presence of the High Commissioners. We had one with the previous High Commissioner, Her Excellency Vicky Trudell. We also had one recently with the current High Commissioner, which is uh, Mr. Charles Hay. And then we talk about miscellaneous topics in oil and gas and energy, inclusive competency and capability building, because we do represent companies from the UK who can bring wealth of knowledge and experience in terms of training and developing expertise. We organize a technical webinar in, in the area of decommissioning with Petronas and that particular uh, webinar is becoming automatic now whenever there are events when it, uh, on decommissioning, by and large Petronas would want to do it with us. And we have a uh, presence of subject matter experts experts from the UK when it comes to decommissioning and we do discuss that with Petronas quite, quite a lot. We hosted networking reception in conjunction with the Oil and Gas Asia, OGA, in 2019. Like I said, we firmly believe a good relationship makes good, good business. Now, we also had the privilege to co-organize a forum. The forum is called Transitioning to Renewables. And we had uh, we had we did that together with the then Minister of Mestec, together with Petronas, a couple of years ago. Now time flies so fast. We were born in 2017. We are now four years old. Fast forward to 2021, which is now. Today actually marks the second Energy Outlook event hosted by BMCC Energy Committee. Now for your information, we had one event similar like this about a year ago. And we were lucky enough because the event that we did a year ago was immediately before the nationwide movement control order. So we, we were lucky. And at that point in time, the event was attended by esteemed speakers from TNB Renewables, from EA, EIC, from Petronas. And it was attended by more than 100 participants. So in closing, I'm delighted, you know, we are all delighted to have this event again today although uh, we have to do it virtually, not physically and not at, Man at the Mandarin Oriental Hotel. And the theme for today's event is charting a new path forward, uh, charting a new path towards sustainability. So I hope everybody will enjoy the event today. Thank you again to Dr. Ali Biju and all speakers today. I hope everybody will, will benefit from the session today. So back to you, uh, Ro or, uh, or Jennifer. Thank you, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Hanif. Uh, we, so without further ado, let me now um, invite the Honorable uh, YB Dato Ali Biju, the Deputy Minister of Energy and Natural Resources Malaysia to give his remarks. YB? Yes, thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Uh, Madam Jennifer Lopez, Chief Executive Officer of British Malaysian Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Mohamed Hanif Hashim, Chairman of BMCC Energy Committee and Senior Vice President of Petrofresh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. A very good morning to those who are YB, we can't hear you, YB. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, it's clear now. Uh, Madam Jennifer Lopez, Chief Executive Officer, British Malaysian Chamber of Commerce, Mohammad, Mr. Mohamed Hanif Hashim, Chairman of PMCC Energy Committee and Senior Vice President of Petrofresh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Very good afternoon to those who are in Malaysia and very good morning to those who are in UK. First and foremost, I would like to thank the British Malaysian Chamber of Commerce for inviting the Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources to this event. On behalf of Yang Rahman, Dato Sri, 
Dr. Shamsul Anwar bin Nasarah, Ministry of Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources, I would like to convey his sincere apologies for not being able to attend to this program due to conflicting schedules. Nevertheless, I would like to express my sincere appreciation and gratitude to the British Malaysian Chamber of Commerce for giving us this opportunity to meet and engage with the professionals and experts of the economic and energy fields to deliver this special address in today's PMCC Energy Outlook 2021 program. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the year 2020 has been a very challenging year for all of us. Malaysia, just like any other countries in the world, was not spared from the wrath of COVID-19 pandemic. COVID outbreak has put many countries at the economic crossroad in which there is a strong sense of uncertainty and ambiguity in future economic growth and development. During the Movement Control Order 1.0, which started in March 2020, until June 2020, electricity demand in peninsular Malaysia had significantly dropped by 20%. It was indeed challenging for us to maintain a sustainable grid operation. However, as Albert Einstein once said, in the midst of every crisis, lies great opportunities. Malaysia, which is blessed with an abundance of various indigenous renewable energy sources such as solar, hydro, biomass, and by guess, took the opportunity to further accelerate the sustainable energy agenda as a means for economic recovery post-COVID-19. Ladies and gentlemen, energy plays a very important role when it comes to achieving government sustainability goals. It is one of the economic sectors that is crucial in charting the path for sustainable development. Sustainability is always placed high on national agenda. This policy is evident in many of the government policies, such as 11 Malaysian Plan, Share Prosperity Vision 2030, and will continue to be, to be in the 12 Malaysian Plan. This shows the commitment of our country in preserving cleaner environment for our future generation. However, one must not forget that energy sustainability has to be balanced with ensuring energy supply security and affordability for the people. To this end, the government has to strike a balance between the three elements of the energy trilemma of security, affordability, and sustainability in providing energy supply to the people. We cannot pursue our sustainability agenda at the expense of people's affordability and our nation energy security. Thus, in transitioning towards greater, to a greener electricity supply, Malaysia has set a target of 31% of renewable energy, RE, in its installed capacity in 2025 and 40% in 2035. To that, the installed capacity of RE in Malaysia is 7,995 megawatts or equivalent to 22.5% of the country's total power mix, with hydro, including large and mini hydro, contributing 5,863.9 megawatt, solar, 1,368.9 megawatt, biomass, 637.6 megawatt, Biogas 124.3 megawatt. With the new RE targets set by the government, the peninsular Malaysia power sector is set to reduce its emission intensity of GDP by 45% in 2030 and 65% in 2039 relative to the emission intensity of GDP in 2005, in line with Malaysia commitment under the Paris Agreement. <coughs> Solar is expected to continue to be the major contributor to our e-mix apart from hydro with its vast potential. However, many of us tend to forget or choose to forget that solar power has its limitation. The intermittency of solar power requires support from the grid or battery storage, which means that 
there is additional cost to the system to manage the intermittency of solar energy. The intermittency of solar energy also requires a robust grid system to ensure security of supply. Hence, we must always trade cautiously when making decision to increase solar uptake to our, solar, to our system. Taking into account that we need to balance the other two elements of energy trilemma, energy security and affordability. Having said that, we have witnessed globally the accelerating the growth of RE sector proved to be one of the most impactful actions that can be undertaken by to accelerate economic recovery. Hence, the one gigawatt was a contract on the large scale solar LSS program by Malaysian electricity industry to attract RE investment, or better known as LSS Mentari, was announced in May 2020 as part of Malaysia broader COVID-19 recovery measures. As many of us here would like to know, the LSS program, which aims at developing utility scale solar power plant, was first introduced in 2016. Since the inception of this program, four rounds of bidding exercise has been carried out to offer a total of 2,500 MW of solar quota. In the recently completed bidding exercise, the 1,000 MW solar quota offered have been oversubscribed by six times. The bids offered were at par with global solar pricing, with 56 out of 93 bidders offering price, prices below 20 cents per kilowatt hour for capacity between 30 to 50 megawatt. And the lowest bid received is 13.99 cents per, per kilowatt hour. This indicates that the pathway to more sustainable energy future is becoming more equitable and competitive. The implementation of LSS Mantari is expected to generate 4 billion worth of investment as well as creating 12,000 job opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, our journey toward a lower carbon pathway is not only focused in building large-scale power plants. We need to be innovative in coming up with new policies and programs to achieve our renewable energy targets. In 2016, the Net Energy Metering or NEM program was first introduced, allowing consumers to enjoy a reduction in their electricity bill by offsetting the electricity consumption with electricity generated from the rooftop solar system installed at their own residential or business premises. The implementation of NAM program is the manifestation of the government efforts in realizing the potential of rooftop solar as a means in addressing climate change and at the same time driving the growth of the country's economy with the creation of greater investment and employment opportunities. The name uptake was it when it was first introduced was not encouraging until the government introduced NEM 2.0 in 2019, which allowed one-to-one -one offset basis. After a year of introducing the new buyback rate, the 500 megawatt quota allocated for NEM was fully subscribed by 2020. Recognizing the encouraging up uptake of NEM, the government has launched the NEM 3.0 program in January 2021. The program aims to provide more opportunities for users to install solar photovoltaic system on the rooftop of their respective buildings for electricity bill reduction. NEM 3.0 program involves three sub-programs, namely the NEM people, NEM government, government ministry and entity, entities, and NEM NOVA, net offset virtual integration, which offers 500 megawatt of solar quota until 2023, or until all quota is 
fully set to cry whichever comes first. Apart from LSS and name, the fit in tariff fit program continues to be implemented by SEDA, the Sustainable Energy Development Authority, to increase electricity generation from other RE, RE sources such as mini hydro, biomass, and biogas. E bidding was introduced to this RE sources as price recovery mechanism since 2018. The e bidding exercise was also aimed at driving the RE price down and to optimize the utilization of RE fund so that more quota can be allocated. As a result, we have seen the price of biogas and small hydro has gone down from 37. 8 cent per kilowatt hour in 2018 to between 23.45 to 26.13 kilowatt hour in 2020 for biogas and from 26 cent per kilowatt hour in 2019 to between 32.88 to 25.99 cent per, per kilowatt hour in 2020 for mini hydro. The ministry has also approved the allocation of 322 megawatt quarter to assist Ministry of Housing and Local Government in implementing waste to energy projects as a two pronged strategy to provide reliable electricity from RE and effectively manage the municipal solid waste in Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been done by World Energy Council in 2020 on 37 utility companies around the world. All companies have identified that future challenges will be centered around three Ds of digitalization, decentralization, and decarbonization. These three Ds will be the new norms of the energy industry globally, and Malaysia must be prepared do future proof our electricity supply industry in order to face these challenges. With more and more variable renewable energy or VRE coming on stream, our grid needs to be digitalized. The government made the right decision in 2018 when we agreed for TNP to install 1.5 million smart meters in Peninsula Malaysia for the period of 2018 until 2020. I am proud to announce that we have installed more than 1 million smart meters as of now, and that we believe that we will reach the target of installing 1.5 million smart meters in August 2021. This is a remarkable achievement considering that the take up rate was only 281 and 66 in early 2020 due to the challenges we faced in educating the public on the many benefits enjoyed through installation of smart meters in your home. We hope to install more smart meters in coming years and continue to be ahead of other ASEAN countries vis-a-vis -vis installation of smart meters. Ladies and gentlemen, in our pursuit of the sustainability sustainable energy agenda. The government also emphasizes the demand side of the energy chain. It does not make sense for us to keep on building solar power plant to increase all the electricity supply when we do not do enough to conserve what we already have. Energy efficiency is another source of electricity supply which we often tend to neglect. It is a must have for countries to complete the whole sustainability features of the energy sector. Hence, the government has undertaken various governments, various programs and initiatives to promote energy efficiency and conservation, EEC, and implement energy efficiency measures across the country. The introduction of National Energy Efficiency Action Plan 2016-2025 or NEEAP 2016-2025 will allow us to save approximately 52,000 
gigawatt of electricity and achieve 8% of electricity demand growth reduction, which is expected to reduce 38 million tons of CO2 equivalent of greenhouse emission. The plan provides the instrument for successful implementation of energy efficiency strategies in the country through a well coordinated and cost effective implementation of energy efficiency measures in industrial, commercial, and residential sectors, and is expected to reach a total of 6.3 billion RM of investment with the total direct monetary saving of RM 18.5 billion. Recently, my ministry has introduced program to encourage customers to buy energy efficiency appliances, which we call the SAF 2.0 program or Sustainability Achieved by Energy Efficiency 2.0 program. SAF 2.0 program was approved under the national budget 2021 with an allocation of RM 30 million where 200 RM e-repair is given to households to purchase air conditioners or refrigerators with a four or five star energy rating level by the Energy Commission of Malaysia. The SAFE 2.0 program aims to encourage consumers to practice energy efficient while contributing to energy consumption savings and lower electricity bills. Through this program, Malaysia can potentially reduce carbon emission by about 40,000 tons per year, which is equivalent to 56,340 trees that need to be planted for 10 years to absorb that amount of carbon. A number of 150,000 households are expected to benefit the benefit from this program with an estimated 22.26 billion worth of energy saving annually. Ladies and gentlemen, in a nutshell, the government will not be able to achieve this sustainable goal, energy goal, without the support of the various stakeholders in the industries. We always welcome feedback and constructive advice from all stakeholders to further enhance our policies and introduce programs which are beneficial to the people in the nation. Lest we forget, whatever policies and programs that we implement in the power sector would have an impact on all segments of society. Thus, we must always have a balanced approach in pursuing our sustainable energy agenda. In this regard, it is my wish that we will continue to strengthen our cooperation for an inclusive, affordable, sustainable, and secure energy future, which is essential for economic and social development of our nation. As Malaysia navigates the path towards energy transition, your valuable ideas will be able to contribute towards the development of a sustainable, efficient, and reliable energy future. In closing, on behalf of our ministry and Malaysian government, I wish all of you to have a fruitful and successful program. With that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you YB. YB, thank you for that insightful uh, session speaking on the, the Malaysian government's agenda, plans and commitment to, on sustainable energy as well as energy saving and efficiency. So uh, why be, you know, for we are very pleased, uh, at least I'm pleased, good, it's good to hear about sustainability energy, the importance you mentioning about sustainability, sustainability energy be, being uh, the importance of sustainability energy in economic recovery. So why be with that, uh, we thank you so much for joining us. We greatly appreciate uh, you know, you're taking time of your busy schedule and your commitment to be here and to share the plans and your point on continuously working together with uh, for the strengthening the opportunities to collaborate. So we look forward to 
you know, uh, co connecting with your office again to identify and, you know, any collaboration opportunities to promote the agenda. Thank you, YB. All right, thank you very much, Farah. Thank you. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, so before I introduce our next speaker, Ken, uh, a little bit of uh, administrative rules. We hope that you will take this opportunity to raise as many questions as possible for our speakers and panelists. You may do so using the Q&A function. If you, um, you can do it as our speakers are speaking or even during the moderating session. So please know that the questions will only be addressed during, during the Q&A panel session, and I'm sure the chair will do his best to address all your questions as much as time permits. So our next speaker, we are honored to have the UK government's COP26 Regional Ambassador to Asia Pacific and South Asia. I understand that he just finished his posting in Rome, where he worked closely with the Italian government ahead of the joint bid for UK to host uh, COP26 and served in many British embassies in, uh, sorry, served in British embassies in Tokyo and Paris and is well informed you know, on the issue of uh, various issues, especially on climate change and energy. So may I invite uh, Ken to give your remarks. Ken, over to you. Good afternoon, Jennifer, and good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be addressing this webinar, and I'm very pleased it's being organised jointly um, by the British Malaysia Chamber of Commerce with the support of the British High Commission in Kuala Lumpur. Um, and good afternoon as well to the Honourable um, Deputy Minister of the Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources Malaysia, Datuk Ali Biju, for his opening remarks. I found them incredibly interesting, uh, and it was great to hear about the progress being made in renewable energy across Malaysia. And I think you really gave us a sense of urgency um, for the energy transition um, in the country. These are exactly the sorts of positive messages I'm hearing a lot now in the Asia Pacific region, including in particular in Southeast Asia. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, leaders from across the world will travel to Glasgow in November this year, including, we hope, from Malaysia to attend the COP26 summit on climate change. Delivering a successful COP26 summit is a top priority for the UK government and for our Prime Minister. We want the event to mark a clear step forward in global efforts to drive down emissions and tackle the impacts of climate change. We're working hard to be engaging governments, businesses and societies worldwide to deliver strong climate action between now and November. The challenge facing us is clear. Without urgent action, we will not keep climate change to 1.5 or even 2 degrees Celsius. And the consequences for populations worldwide of such a failure would be catastrophic. The energy, sorry, International Energy Agency has assessed that if we are to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, the global transition to clean power needs to progress four times faster than at present. And so that's why the energy transition is one of the key campaigns that we are running as COP26 presidency. The campaign is particularly important here in Asia, given Asia's role as the driver of the global economy, and of course the large pipeline of fuel and primarily coal projects across the region. In Asia, as elsewhere, governments are currently working hard to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, which is thankfully now tapering in many countries, and large-scale vaccination programmes are now in place. As governments move back to kickstart their economies in 2021, they have enacted major economic stimulus packages to create jobs and to protect livelihoods. The UK strongly supports the message from the UN Secretary General that governments should take this opportunity to deliver a clean, green and resilient recovery. The economic stimulus packages announced by governments um, should be targeted towards the green tech and renewables area. Thankfully, clean power is already a growth industry, so governments that invest now will be positioning their economies in a booming industrial sector that will position them at the forefront of the most innovative economies worldwide, whereas failing to take these opportunities will risk them losing competitive advantage. Governments will also be supporting jobs. Investment in renewables has been shown to deliver substantially more jobs than in the fossil fuel sector. And ARENA reports that boosting investment in renewables would increase jobs in the sector to 42 million globally by 2050, four times more than today. 
And of course, governments across Asia also need to respond to growing concerns from citizens on health. Clean power is good for public health. There are currently more than 800,000 deaths every year globally from the pollution generated by burning coal. Low carbon investment can create savings on healthcare and environmental costs, sometimes worth eight times more than the cost of the investments themselves, as a result of fewer negative health and environmental impacts. But as important as the arguments for growth, employment and health are, there's one even more powerful argument for accelerating the energy transition, and one which is delivering change much faster than most of us would have expected just a few years ago. That argument is cost. As was heard from the Deputy Minister's presentation, the cost of renewable energy and storage has dramatically fallen over the last few years. Solar and wind are already cheaper than gas power in most countries, and including to independent analysis across ASEAN, including here in Malaysia. And we know that these costs will continue to fall. Hydro and solar are already widely deployed, deployed in the Southeast Asia region with biogas and biomass driven power generation also featuring in many countries. This is leading to major changes in government policies across Asia. Bangladesh has recently cancelled all but two of their 29 plant coal plants. Pakistan and the Philippines have announced a full moratorium on new coal and Vietnam um, has just recently cancelled the majority of coal plants planned in their country. I know that Malaysia is also looking at, at its own coal-fired fleet, TNB, um, your largest power utility, publicly announced in a tra energy transition seminar where I attended in October at iGEM, and that they have commissioned their last coal power plant in 2020. So there are no, there are prospects at least, of no new coal-fired plants for Malaysia under the proposed new national energy policy where an announcement is imminent. I know that Malaysia is also keen to grow its installed renewable energy capacity to reach 30% of the power mix by 2030. That's a major transition which will of course require major clean energy investments and this is the kind of market signal that investment world wants and needs to hear. In addition, I know that Malaysia and Singapore are joining forces on a cross-border venture on developing and trading renewable energy powered electricity to Singapore. These kinds of decisions by governments across Asia reflect the fact that coal is simply no longer competitive. Carbon Tracker has assessed that very soon, perhaps as early as this year for some countries, it will be cheaper to build new renewable energy facilities than to run existing coal plants. So countries that proceed with plans to build new coal plants run the risk, or indeed I would say the certainty, of creating stranded assets for the future. So it's no surprise that investors are also changing their posture and are avoiding new investments in coal. Coal is now a doomed industry. Of course, there will of course be some who continue to argue for new coal, despite the clear economic, social and climate arguments to the contrary. But if investors are backing out, then something is clearly changing in the finance landscape. Despite moves from the Indian government, for example, to boost their own coal production, recent coal for bids there have shown a distinct lack of interest from investors in pursuing coal. India is instead a world leader in the renewable sector with booming investment in solar in particular. And we very much welcome the recent announcement by Mitsubishi that it was backing out from a coal power plant in Vietnam uh, as well. And there's also strong support for accelerating progress to renewables from the private sector. In Cambodia recently, several international companies which currently outsource production to Cambodia wrote to the Cambodian government, underlining it was essential for them to access renewable energy sources, citing pressure from both their clients and their shareholders. So the market is delivering change, and we are working with governments across Asia to accelerate that change. We welcomed China's announcement last year that it would move to a carbon neutral economy by 2060, and we expect this to accelerate progress on the energy transition, both within China and across Asia. As China ramps up its domestic adoption of renewables, costs are likely to fall sharply across global markets. 
And we are, of course, also seeing other countries like Japan, South Korea, Laos announce their own net zero targets in recent months. I very much look forward to more such announcements from our Asian partners this year, including, I hope, here in Malaysia. We and our partners are also challenging market distortions, which are slowing down the energy transition in some economies worldwide. And we're working with business and civil society to ensure that calls for transparency and citizens' interests are heard. As private capital is moving away from coal, we're also working to build pressure on those governments, notably Japan, South Korea and China, which continue to support new coal projects overseas. We've underlined that new coal projects are not compatible with international Paris commitments and are not in the economic interests of the countries which they're purported to be supporting. The countries concerned have made some initial steps towards ending such support, and we hope that they will soon announce a complete end to such financing. So all this means that there will be a sharp and irreversible move away from coal and towards renewables across Asia in coming years. We're working with multilateral institutions such as the Asian Development Bank and ASEAN to ensure that governments have the support they need to manage that transition. But it's not an area where governments or multilateral development banks can provide alone everything that's needed. It's clear that private investment is essential to deliver the energy demands of growth intensive Asian economies. We expect Asia to continue to drive the global economy in the year and the decade ahead, and that will mean that renewable energy will continue to be a growth sector across the region. That presents clear opportunities for investors, which I strongly encourage participants at today's event to seize. Finally, I'd like to say that I hope that the economic rationale for investment in the renewable sector would stand on its own. Renewable energy is clearly a sector that will deliver strong returns for companies that invest now. But I know that there's also a growing desire from investors to support international action against climate change, which is something that shareholders, clients, and indeed employees increasingly demand. That's why we see so many companies now committing <clears throat> to ambitious net zero targets and pressing host governments to accelerate the energy transition. Even in the oil and gas sector, SOEs such as Petronas are boldly making new net zero aspiration publicly. And we look forward to hearing more details about that announcement. The UK COP26 presidency is keen to work with business and investors as an integral part of our preparations to ensure that we have a holistic approach to delivering climate action worldwide. We are strong supporters of the Net Zero initiative through the Race to Zero campaign, and I'm keen to work with companies and investors as part of my own role across the Asia-Pacific region. I'm pleased to hear that three Malaysian companies have signed up to the Race to Zero campaign so far, along with the capital city of Kuala Lumpur. So let's keep this discussion going. Events such as this clearly provide a useful forum for sharing experience, ideas and policy leads on what works in this region and Malaysia in the energy transition space. I look forward uh, to the Q&A session uh, shortly and uh, I wish our colleagues a very good seminar today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Uh, look forward to the Q&A session. So I will have to move on to the next speaker quickly. Our next speaker is Dr. Jason Maripan, who has uh, more than 20 years working experience in the power and financial services with a focus on clean energy. Prior to his current role as a head of new energy Petronas, his experience spans from senior roles related to renewable and clean energy in leading organizations in Singapore, Malaysia, including a secondment with the UK government to advise on climate change mitigation projects. So here he is to share about Petronas efforts in diversifying energy supply. Over to you, Jason. Thanks very much, uh, Jennifer. And uh, good afternoon, uh, YB Dutta, uh, distinguished guests and delegates. Um, thank you very much. Uh, to the organizers BMCC, uh, supported by the British High Commission for the kind invite and opportunity to speak with you today. Now, today's theme is all about charting a new path towards sustainability, uh, and this encompasses economic, uh, environmental, and social aspects. I want to, and I hope to share with you on Patronus's expanding portfolio towards clean energy sources. 
our net zero carbon aspiration, as well as what Petronas is doing as an organization to support the move towards a low carbon economy, both in Malaysia and globally. Uh, next slide, please. So firstly, as you all know, uh, there are increasing calls for a low carbon economy, which we've just heard, and uh, decarbonized world is really hastening a shift towards renewables and cleaner sources of energy. Uh, this has been well uh, publicized these last few years, but has really intensified, particularly in this last year. Renewables are expected to meet over 62% of the world's energy demand by 2050, according to uh, BNEF. Now, this shift is driven by a number of factors, including policies for climate change, the decreasing costs of renewables. Uh, we heard earlier from uh, YB Dotok uh, that in the large scale solar tender, uh, the most recent one, which is LSS4, we've seen bid prices down to just under 14 ringgit cents per kilowatt hour, which is competitive with most other sources of, of uh, electricity supply. Technology advancements, particularly of enabling technologies such as energy storage and pressure from shareholders, advocacy groups, employees, and consumers themselves. All of these factors are driving increased corporate participation in the low carbon economy, including oil and gas majors, and has elevated low carbon ambitions as part of their company's strategy. So as an integrated energy player, Petronas will continue to play its part in meeting the world's energy needs by offering cleaner sources of energy, uh, such as natural gas and renewables, where combined will balance the energy trilemma of affordability, security, and sustainability. Uh, next slide, please. So oil and gas companies are uh, increasingly venturing and growing their renewable energy business, um, increasing the competitiveness of the industry further, but also providing impetus and capital to the overall scale up that's required. Renewables plays a key role in meeting a number of different objectives for oil and gas companies. Firstly, renewables contributes to the various carbon targets that companies have set. To date, six international oil and gas companies have announced net zero carbon emissions targets by 2050. Secondly, through rebalancing, uh, which will see the, the uh, oil and gas companies through the energy transition. This includes rebalancing the portfolio with uh, renewables as well as other low carbon solutions to complement the other parts of their uh, businesses. Companies have recognized the energy transition creates both risks, but also opportunities, and therefore rebalancing their portfolios accordingly. Uh, next slide, please. If we, if we look at the growth of renewables around the world, we see significant inroads by renewables in Europe and North America. However, moving forward, Asia Pacific will lead growth in the RE industry with over 4,000 gigawatts of RE capacity additions expected by 2050, with 60% of those coming from solar. For Southeast Asia, this is expected to be over 500 uh, gigawatts. So uh, what is Petronas doing in this area? Uh, next slide, please. To ready itself for the changing energy landscape, Petronas started its sustainability journey over two decades uh, by integrating sustainable practices into its business and decision-making. In 2020, we announced our commitment to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Uh, this was the first Asian oil and gas company to do so. And this initiative is among a number of deliberate steps we've taken based on our sustainability agenda, namely continued value creation, safeguarding the environment, initiating positive social impact, and responsible governance. In 2018, um, and I remember now, um, you know, uh, being part of the BMCC 
uh, event back in 2018, Patronus decided to step out as part of its three-pronged strategy into new business areas that can help the company through the energy transition, whilst protecting it from volatile fossil fuel prices, particularly of the kind that we've seen in this last year. Now, one of these step out areas was new energy, and that's the business that, uh, that I head at Petronas. In 2019, Petronas also adopted a new statement of purpose, which is a progressive and solutions partner enriching lives for, sus for a sustainable future. And to help deliver on this statement, it set up the gas and new energy division as a one-stop center for clean energy solutions. And these step out areas, including uh, new energy uh, with solar and wind, um, hydrogen, as well as the establishment of a venture capital arm to support the investment in, future, in the future energy space. Also in 2019, we made our first acquisition in the new energy space, which was a solar company called Amplus Energy Solutions. Uh, next slide, please. So today we're focusing on solar uh, with both distributed energy, that's rooftop and on site directly to the customers, as well as utility scale. In wind, we're also venturing in both onshore and offshore wind. And we're also developing hybrid options for renewables with storage technologies, providing longer and more flexible solutions for clean energy generation and supply. At the heart of all of this approach will be our customers, and we aim to provide solutions directly to utilities, commercial and industrial customers, as well as residential. So what are we doing here in Malaysia? Next slide, please. So today we're an established renewable energy player with, with over one gigawatt of operating and under development solar projects. Uh, these consist of 400 individual projects with over 200 partners and customers, including uh, the Tesco supermarket chain, which has been now rebranded as Lotus uh, in Malaysia, multinationals such as Amazon, Cisco, Yamaha, Hilton Hotels, and many more. And we have over 300 dedicated professionals and are looking to extend, expand our business across the region. The focus, as I mentioned before, has been on the distributed energy space, which we aim to grow, but also expand into utility scale, wind, uh, solar, and corporate energy storage, and in incorporate energy storage into our projects to meet customer needs. Uh, next slide, please. So through our brands, um, we have M Plus Solar in India and Dubai, we have M Plus by Patronus in Malaysia. We provide customized solutions for commercial and industrial customers. The solutions include on-site solar, where we offer a zero capex model. Uh, this helps customers reduce their energy bills from day one without taking any technical or financial risk. We also are providing an increasing amount of corporate PPAs through offsite or open access projects. Uh, this is particularly in India, where regulation allows, and potentially in Southeast Asia, if the transmission and distribution network is opened up to independent renewable suppliers. Increasingly, to deal with the customer appetite for more flexible solutions, we're also developing the hybrid projects that can integrate different types of renewables, sometimes thermal power and energy storage, to meet the demand of the customers. We also have a state-of-the-art monitoring solution that helps track plant performance called Hawk AI. With this, we are optimizing performance to, to, to best meet customer needs with a very friendly, portable user interface and customizable reports. For the residential sector, we have our Homescape brand, which we've been offering a residential solar package to our customers. And finally, we have an EV fleet service solution under our brand Yellow. Uh, this is so far in India where we've been using three wheelers and soon to be two wheelers to deliver from e-commerce warehouses 
to customers. This currently operates in two cities in India, and we are looking at the potential for other markets, including Malaysia. So next slide, please. In Malaysia, uh, today we have various types of customers and applications for our solar solutions, including uh, shipyards, universities, petrol stations, and even hypermarkets. Uh, I mentioned earlier, the, um, we have the largest PPA in the country for rooftop solar, supplying 15 stores at the now uh, rebanded uh, Lotus hypermarkets around Malaysia. And these initiatives include uh, projects at Petronas operations in line with the company's decarbonization efforts and net zero carbon emissions at Aspiration. Some of the projects that are planned for this year uh, include the Pengarang Integrated Petroleum Complex, which will be the largest solar project for Petronas assets to date, and the single biggest solar project in Malaysia for solar consumption uh, in industry, uh, with a first phase incorporating both rooftop and ground mounted. We have a project of Malaysia Marine Heavy Engineering, which will be Malaysia's first sustainable fabrication yard. Uh, we have a project at University Technology Petronas, which will be the largest single rooftop project in Asia. Um, we have a project at our training center, INSTEP, where we will integrate renewables as part of the development of our human capital. And we are also expanding solarization of our fuel stations around Malaysia, some of which already include EV charging points. Uh, next slide, please. In India, we have the largest open access solar farm at a single location in Karnataka. This is where we sell power through corporate PPAs to the likes of ABB, GE, Cisco, and Honeywell. And this allows the customers to benefit better from the low solar energy prices where we build at scale. And this is where they don't have the, roofs, the roof space for large on-site generation. The next slide, please. So the energy transition will undoubtedly require new business models. And in this area where we aim to bring innovation to our customers in providing new solutions, including things like peer-to-peer -peer trading and the integration of different technologies such as distributed generation, energy storage, energy efficiency, and electrical via, uh, electric vehicle charging. Now, these innovations will help us meet the changing trends and consumer demands. Uh, next slide, please. And overall, I think Malaysia and Asia Pacific has a lot of room for growth in renewables. Uh, this is where we are focusing our uh, business growth. Um, however, we still see significant challenges and Ken mentioned some of these uh, in his earlier opening remarks. If we want to help meet governments and corporates aspiration for renewables and reducing carbon, then those challenges need to be overcome. And they include policy and regulation, which really needs to change in line with this energy transition. This, is, this means more access to grids, and more recognition of cleaner solutions in policy development and market mechanisms so that countries can benefit from greater security, lower environmental impacts, as well as lower costs to consumers. Finally, our aim is to grow this business across Asia Pacific. And in order to do that, we need partnerships and collaboration to achieve the scale and solutions that are required. This different, the different technical capabilities, the capital requirements, the local know-how, the access to areas of high renewable resource all necessitate partnerships. So we at Petronas New Energy are happy to collaborate with you to make this happen. And to conclude this presentation, I would want, I'd like to once again, just share that, um, that Petronas New Energy uh, now we've been uh, there for, for nearly two years. 
We have the ready capabilities and expertise to contribute significantly to meet customers' clean energy needs of the future. Thank you for your time, and please do get in touch if you want to partner or collaborate for a sustainable energy future. I look at the Q&A. Thank you, Jay. So um, thank you, Jay. We will hear more from Jay later at the Q&A session. Um, so please send in your questions. Uh, let, before for any delay, may I invite now, uh, may I invite now, uh, sorry about that, <laughs> Azman, Azman, who is the Regional Director of uh, EIC, the Energy Industry Council. Azman has a uh, very vast experience representing I know Azman has one of very, very well worse in the energy sector uh, and EIC is representing the energy supply chain. He's the person to speak to if you want to know more about the Asia Pacific region. So may I pass the mic to Azman now. Azman, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jennifer. Um, and thank you very much, uh, everybody uh, and my fellow speakers. It is uh, an honor for me to share the virtual speaking stage with my with just such distinguished speakers, including the Honorable YB uh, Deputy Minister. As you have heard from the earlier speakers, energy transition and climate change initiatives are very much talked about these days and seem to start influencing and shaping decisions by businesses in the energy sector. In my presentation, it will be a bit different from the previous presentations. I, I will share a short analysis from uh, data extracted from our very own energy projects database and uh, which hopefully in turn would be able to help companies to make the right decisions in this very challenging business, business conditions. My focus is more on energy projects and you will see how things have changed, especially from the year 2020. Okay, um, next please. Let me just uh, spend a few minutes, uh, well, a few seconds, perhaps we don't have time now. Uh, I'm trying to go very fast so that we have more time for Q&A. Uh, allow me to spend a bit of time to introduce AIC as an organization. I mean, the screen shows all the activities that we have. We have been around for 75 years now after incorporation in 1943. Essentially, our role is to help our members, our members understand, identify, and pursue business opportunities globally. We are a not-for-profit organization, uh, one of the uh, largest and oldest. We have membership of UK and global companies of uh, about 700 companies who deliver goods and services to the energy industries worldwide. And we do that through providing market intelligence to our members uh, from our EIC databases, as shown the three databases. Data stream is the CapEx database, CapEx uh, energy projects, CapEx, and then asset map is the uh, OPEX, and supply map is where we have all the UK supply chain list of companies uh, listed in the, in the database. Okay, next please, Ro. Right, okay, uh, I will concentrate more on the two sessions, which is mature, what I call mature energy sectors and the energy transition technologies. Next, Ro. Mature energy set, what I call mature energy sectors are, are these sectors, oil and gas, thermal power, nuclear, onshore renewables, and offshore wind. Next, please. Right, okay, this, these three graphs actually um, show um, uh, the quantity of project announcements made in the oil and gas, the first one, the first graph on the left, uh, in the sector up to till 2020. As you can see, at the upstream, following the 2014 oil crisis, upstream oil and gas was severely down, but things started to pick up till 2019. And 2020 was supposed to be the uh, bumper year, which we thought we'd be seeing the return to good times. However, COVID-19 then arrived, resulting in a drop announcement for upstream projects in the year 2020. You will also notice that in the year 2020, there was a significant increase in Decom, decommissioning projects, which include projects involving extending life of existing assets via redevelopment activities. For midstream, as you can see, it's, it's quite a stable market overall, with LNG, growth in LNG being evidence. This supports the view that gas is 
this is going to be the transitional fuel towards achieving the uh, decarbonization targets. And finally, for downstream, as expected, sustained lower fixed stock price, growth and increase in project announcements from 2017 to 18. However, uh, then COVID then happened, then the price of uh, the, the, the demand was the demand dropped. And the interesting area to keep an eye though, if you look at the, the, the graph on the right, will be biofuels, which seems to be seeing some growth since last year. Next, please, Rob. Now, in this slide, you can see the uh, how thermal power projects are reducing, renewable projects are replacing them in an almost direct correlation. This is a good indicator to show that COP21 uh, previously, uh, the, the measures uh, is working. And that in general, th there are positive indications towards reduction of carbon emissions overall globally. And for offshore wind, if you can see the, 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 the relevant graph, for offshore wind, although the quantity of announced projects is quite small, but bear in mind that these are projects with large capacity. We are talking about gigawatts here, so much larger project values compared to other projects. Okay, uh, next. Now is the uh, um, overall look back at the mature energy sectors. There's been steady growth from 2016 to, to 2020, even with COVID. COVID. Important point to note here is that in 2020, 70% of all energy projects were renewable projects. This shows, again, I, I, I repeat, this shows that COP21 worked because evidently there, was, there has been a massive swing in power generation from thermal to renewable. 2018 was the first year ever when more than 50% of projects announced were renewables. And now uh, in 2020, uh, last year, we've surpassed 70%. Next. Please, I gotta say please that you change, right? Okay, thank you. So however, looking forward now, what's fascinating is that the data shows a still very healthy oil and gas market in terms of value, it's still growing. The oil and gas sector still holds a $4 trillion value over a five year, a five year period, as you can see. Next, please, Ro. Uh, looking forward in the, in the onshore renewables, it's safe to say that there will be a noticeable high growth. This makes sense because it is still the easiest way for countries to decarbonize, focusing on power generation. Onshore renewable technologies such as onshore wind, solar, and hydropower are commoditized technologies which are proven and easily accessible. And also, with uh, uh, cycle times are much shorter than offshore and with faster ROI, meaning more projects and faster, faster growth. This sector is translates to $1 trillion in market size equivalent to 2025. Okay. Next row, please. Next. As you can see in this slide, before 2020, there was hardly any growth in hydrogen and carbon, carbon, carbon capture. But 2020, you see a huge jump there. I believe 2020 was the year for hydrogen because more than 100 projects were announced in one year. There has simply been amazing interest in hydrogen driven by both the COVID as well as the uh, COP26, uh, which is going to happen this year. An interesting point to note here is that the huge challenge projects announced were green hydrogen projects compared to the other colors. You, know, you have blue, gray, and whatever. As for CCUS or carbon capture, it's interesting to look back at it because carbon capture is not a new technology. It has been around for many, many years. Uh, but it has a checkered history of government policies supporting and then reversing that support, which is why the supply chain remains nervous because, uh, uh, because of that. However, there has been re renewed interest uh, lately in carbon capture linking to, linked to industry emissions capture. Next, please. A few more slides to go. Slide, okay. Um, in this slide, we are look, we've got the combined look back on energy transition. It's obvious here that the massive growth is dominated by hydrogen and energy storage. Next, please. Looking at the uh, hydrogen sector, you will see that the spike in project announcements in 2020, they don't come through as commission projects until 2025. So nothing much comes through until then. And these projects are only worth about $20 billion in CapEx as compared to the 4 trillion value of projects in oil and gas. Next. 
In fact, you can you can go next twice actually. Uh, jump. I'm just going to skip a few slides so that we can stick to our time. Next. Right, this is basically a snapshot of the quantity of energy projects announced in 2020. The, this chart shows the amazing growth of renewables, PV and wind, which overshadows all other sectors with more than 60% of projects, including offshore wind. For energy transition, the percentage of quantity of projects announced in 2020 is actually quite high, impressive as, as, uh, as well at the 15%. Next, please. However, if you see the next slide, which represents the value of projects. This is a value of project. The previous slide was quantity of projects up to 20. This slide, the value of projects that are to come online between 21 and 25. It paints quite different picture. Oil and gas remains dominant still in terms of value. Renewables still large, but represents only 30% in capex value. It's still 60% of quantity that we saw earlier. And, and, and ET or energy transition is a bit quite small in terms of value, only accounting for 2% of total capex value. Next, I think that we should be the, my last slide, if I'm not mistaken. Next, please, uh, Ro. Thank you. Okay, um, that's the conclusion. Um, let me just, okay, that information. Well, anyway, um, it's, you know, RE, as you can see, RE growth is uh, amazing uh, and it's still growing fast and it will be growing faster than fossil fuel for sure. Um, in terms of business decisions by companies, supply chain, now is the time to go into renewables. Now is the time to find opportunities. If you're not yet in renewables, you should be in renewables. And uh, lastly, um, you know, uh, like I like to point out, I agree with what Dr. J, my, my, my friend Dr. J was talking, was saying just now, collaboration is the key. Okay, with that, I hand back to Jennifer Oro. Thank you so much. Thank you, Azman. Uh, now we have come to our Q&A panel session with all our speakers. The session will be moderated by Dr. Leon Rosario. With Leon, with your expertise in the powertrains electrification, energy systems, power management. We are so pleased to have you here to moderate this session. Leon, over to you. Thanks, thanks, Jennifer. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so just before we go on to the, uh, the, the Q&A session, uh, just gonna quickly give you a, so we still top, uh, stop uh, introduction to, to Ricardo. Um, so some of you may know we are a UK-based organization. Uh, recently set up in, in, uh, uh, in Malaysia. Um, so we are a 100-year-old um, engineering and environmental um, strategic consultant, um, helping our global um, customers decarbonize uh, transport and energy sector. I think, you know, listening to uh, what everyone was saying earlier, it's, uh, it's safe to, 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 to say that, you know, the uh, energy and environment is, is one of humanity's uh, you know, greatest challenge, you know, it's a, a challenge that we all have to uh, embrace and no matter how small our contributions may be. Um, so our vision for the next 100 years is to um, deliver a sustainable future uh, through our work in transport, energy, scarce resources, um, uh, waste management and uh, energy management. Now, our aim is to help companies uh, bring greenhouse um, emissions to negligible uh, uh, levels and to achieve CO2 uh, neutrality as, as soon as possible. So uh, we are spread over 21 countries, uh, Malaysia being the 21st. Uh, we have about 3,000 engineers and, and, and scientists uh, worldwide, all working, you know, very diligently on uh, providing <coughs> innovations and, and solutions to multiple sectors, you know, including the rail, automotive, uh, defense, uh, aerospace, commercial vehicles, and also um, uh, marine sector. And I'd like to say that you know, uh, in, in every assignment that that we undertake, in, in everything that we do, we sort of remain. Uh, true to our uh, ethos of our of our founder, Sir, Sir Harry Ricardo, who in 1915 uh, set out to to maximize efficiency and to uh, eliminate waste. 
Uh, next slide, please, Rob. So in 2019, we started uh, our operations here in, in ASEAN and selected Malaysia as our technical hub uh, to serve the wider uh, ASEAN market. Uh, we grew it organically and the, the three sort of pillars that we're looking at in, in ASEAN is to uh, look at the issues with future transport, future energy systems and uh, scarce resources. Now, we, we need to believe that there is a huge potential for renewable uh, energy and the associated uh, energy management technology and are, and are looking to share our ideas and uh, help companies you know, achieve their journey towards net zero, a goal that we ourselves set uh, to achieve by, by 2030. Uh, next slide, please. So just a final point. Um, our vision is based on uh, qualified ambition. So our core values, why we exist, our vision to, uh, to, to achieve it. Um, you know, we've, we've been around for a little over 100 years, but uh, fairly new in this region. So I'd like to thank the uh, BMCC and also the uh, British uh, High Commission on, uh, for their support as we set up our uh, presence uh, in, in Malaysia. So without taking up any more precious time, we're going to jump into the uh, Q&A session right now. Uh, so please bring your, uh, you know, forward your questions to the uh, Q&A box. We see quite a few already. Um, it's going to take the first one. Um, Ken, for you, if, if, if we may. Um, Southeast Asia's um, growth in electricity demands. Uh, considered one of the fastest in, in the world. Um, this raises energy security concerns as the region becomes more dependent on fluctuations in the global energy market. So it's more of like a, a policy question. How can policy makers steer the region towards a healthy and more sustainable path? Sure, well, I think this is an area, of course, where renewable energy is particularly strong um, because you don't need to import um, sunlight or wind uh, into your economy. And so I, com countries worldwide, but particularly I would say in Asia, um, are seeing renewable energy investment partly um, through that lens. Um, so obviously as COP26 presidency, we are supporting this. Um, I think we would suggest that in order to encourage investment in renewable energies, governments um, of course need to take action on their regulatory frameworks and to allow such investments. Um, the International Energy Agency has called solar the cheapest um, energy in the history of mankind. Uh, but in many markets, solar isn't actually able to compete on a equal footing um, with fossil fuel um, because of the existing market structures. So allowing that level playing field, allowing auctions take place on an equitable footing are particularly important. And of course, as we've heard in Malaysia, um, the uh, improvements to the grid and making sure that grids are able um, to deal um, with the different demands posed by renewable energy are also important. So I think those would be my, my key suggestions. Thank you. That's great, great. Thank you for that, Ken. I think I saw a follow-on question to that, if, if we may. Um, so looking at the current global progress uh, perspective on geopolitics, uh, do you think that um, achieving zero net emissions by 2050 is, is achievable? I think it is possible. I think we're not there yet. I think we need a lot more action um, between now and November when leaders will meet at COP26. But I think we've seen really quite impressive progress in recent months with China's announcement of its 2060 net zero target, Japan, South Korea following suit, the US rejoining the Paris Agreement. Um, I think we now have the majority of G20 members have signed up to net zero targets. We are working with our international partners to increase the number of these announcements. The US has announced that it will be hosting a major event in April for leaders, and I'm sure they will be encouraging uh, countries to make uh, their own net zero announcements before then. And I think we will um, see significant announcements this year. So I think we are optimistic, um, but we think that much more needs to be done. And we will be banging the drum um, between now and November um, for increased climate action worldwide, including here in Asia. Yeah, it's fantastic to hear that, Kenya. Thanks for that. 
uh, Jason, you, you've been uh, very popular on, on the old uh, Q&A box, so uh, quite, quite a few questions coming your, your way. Um, sure. First one for, for you. Um, yeah. yeah, so let's see, take, take this one here. Um, I think it, it's more, more general, it, it's quite a, a popular sort of trend in question. So what support or opportunities uh, available for oil and gas service companies? and renewable energy uh, technology providers to collaborate with Petronas on achieving your net zero to 2050 goals, especially so in think, solar, solar wind yeah. and energy storage. Okay. So I think if we look at, um, uh, Dr. Leon, if we look at our net zero carbon aspirations, they include uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, elements, right? So one is the operational excellence. So you know, reduction of hydrocarbon flaring and venting, uh, capturing mm -hmm. methane emissions, optimizing production in the operations itself, uh, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions through, through energy efficiency improvement, uh, minimizing waste and, and promoting uh, recycling throughout the value chain. So there's, there's, a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of work there. Uh, and that's where we talk about collaboration as well from the oil and gas service providers to work with Petronas to achieve those types of things. For renewables, uh, we work already with, um, with players in the, you know, what is a very competitive renewables industry. And we are by far, no way, you know, a major player in the renewables as we are in oil and gas. So we work with uh, those companies uh, to help us implement projects that we're doing at the moment. So we, we're working with a number of solar EPCs. Uh, we also would like to work with uh, technology um, uh, solution providers and um, you know, new technologies that can, that can help uh, meet these aims. Um, but also uh, please bear in mind that our, you know, um, our targets include uh, expansion around Asia Pacific. So we're happy to work with people there in a very cost competitive industry. We need to, um, you know, work with people to help us uh, be competitive, win projects and meet our customer requirements. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I guess a follow on to, to, to that, uh, you mentioned in your presentation, the, uh, the large uh, solar assets that, that Petronas has in, in Malaysia. Yeah. Um, there's a question in, in the, from, from uh, one of our attendees that uh, is asking about um, wind uh, to, uh, you know, turbines, so offshore and yeah. onshore wind. Yeah. Is that something that Petronas is investing in? So I think we are we currently are looking at, at wind um, uh, specifically in those countries where it's competitive today. So that's um, uh, countries which have uh, medium to high wind uh, speeds, where the electricity can be produced at competitive costs. Um, that's both onshore and offshore. Um, in Malaysia, we we not uh, blessed with. Uh, high wind speeds. Um, we do have some uh, medium wind speeds in, in certain areas. We are exploring how this might be harnessed, um, at least for our offshore operations. Um, to date, though, um, I, I don't feel that uh, grid connected uh, wind is, is, is there yet in terms of competitiveness in Malaysia. But you know, as uh, the technology improves, the scale gets bigger, uh, efficiencies increase. It may be uh, an opportunity uh, down the line. Thank you for that, um, Asman. Question for you, sir. Um, hydrogen has seen a great potential as a fuel of the future and looks promising. Um, to be a low cost uh, option for storing electricity, but obviously it comes with its own challenges as, as you mentioned as well. Um, how can we ensure uh, its uh, deployment as a sustainable source of uh, energy in the uh, transportation sector? Transportation sector? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if just like any uh, new initiatives and new things outside, outside of energy, digitalization or whatever you want to call it, you know, is the, the, the main thing is uh, to make it sustainable for business. 
bankable for business and uh, cost uh, will then uh, keep coming down. And uh, it is feasible for business players to actually come into it, provide services for a long term. And that requires, sometimes that requires the uh, support from the government, obviously. Uh, you know, uh, uh, as you can see in Europe or US, there, there are a lot of, maybe Ken can, can add, uh, help me with uh, specific examples in terms of uh, governments providing incentives and help to the, to the industry players. Okay, yeah, so I guess, you know, uh, what, what would be um, in, in your mind is sort of uh, uh, the, the quickest win in terms of profitability for new energy uh, uh, you know, corporations to invest in and explore? Okay, for supply chain companies, for oil and gas, uh, traditionally oil and gas players, uh, my suggestion is to look for the complementary skill sets that you already have. I, I noticed quite a number of uh, marine subsea players, to name a few, uh, EEW, James Fisher, London Offshore Consultant, LOC, these are all our members, EIC members. They have, they have, been, they have ventured into the RE, especially wind, in, in uh, Taiwan, in Korea, Vietnam. And they have been doing quite well. So because they already have those, those skills anyway. So it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not going to do something new or something too, having too much uh, risk. Yeah, OK, great. Uh, another question that's uh, you know, uh, probably most, most probably targeted to you, Asman, is uh, CCUS, your carbon capture and, and use. Um, what are the major constraints at the moment in deploying that uh, CCUS? Uh, and what are the uh, potential solutions? Well, like, like I said earlier in my presentation, carb carbon capture projects are uh, capital intensive, very much capital mm -hmm. intensive. Uh, in in uh, Asia, we are only seeing China, India, Korea, and maybe Australia are really actively you know, implementing this project because of the high cost. And But again, I would like to uh, take example from US. You ask, uh, there are two Cs, uh, I call it two Cs, uh, C for tax credits. The uh, US government provide very good tax credits uh, which encourage businesses to actually go into, or asset owners to go into uh, uh, carbon capture. And the other C is uh, actually collaboration. I mentioned earlier my you know, collaboration uh, with all the industry, uh, all levels of industry players and uh, to, try to try to drive down the cost. And make it more feasible. Yeah, so it's more, more of a, a concerted effort from, from everyone actually as well. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for that, uh, Jason. One, one, one more for you. Uh, you, you mentioned in your presentation uh, about artificial intelligence and uh, you know the digitalization and how I guess companies that are not you know sort of core energy can participate in in this journey towards. Uh, renewable. Um, so I guess, how does the, uh, you know, the digital transformation um, uh, 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 te technology sort of help create the smart grids for the future? What kind of support do you think, you know, companies uh, who are involved in the digital space, not so much in the energy, you know, can actually participate in, 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 uh, in this agenda? Thanks. I think it's a very good question. I think uh, in my presentation today, we've really looked more at the optimization side of you know, renewable energy projects and how that uh, AI or digitization can, can improve that uh, optimization. But I think as we move forward, when we need to start balancing the, uh, the grids, uh, the you know, putting in a lot more distributed generation, having a lot more energy storage, even moving towards more electrical vehicles, electric vehicles with, with charging, there's going to be a, a much a more need for um, dynamic pricing and dynamic managing of the, of the grid. And I think this is where the digital technologies come in. And we're already seeing a lot of uh, developments of, of startup companies, software companies, AI companies that are working in this area. Some of them already have products where they're able to take the right um, uh, uh, um, 
uh, messages and data from the markets and, uh, and, and then, then have that um, relayed to how you actually manage your, your assets and resources uh, so they can maximize their, their, their use uh, as well as their profit. Um, but we see more of this going forward. And so when I, when I mentioned about um, participating, collaborating with these type of companies, um, we would also like to you know, speak to those companies who have ideas and solutions that can help in that area. That's great. So good, good opportunities for, for startups with, with ideas that they can take forward to solve uh, right. issues that uh, you know, are, are, are you know, important. So that's good. So it, it's good to know that you know, Petrolas has that uh, channel for, for companies with, with new ideas to come forward. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah Dr. Liam, we actually uh, ran a, a, a Petronas 500 uh, accelerator program right. uh, this year. Uh, where we um, we did a call for um, uh, startup companies uh, with a shortlisted number of companies. Um, there was uh, one that we uh, ended in, up in investing in the uh, renewable space, which was a company called Souls Energy, uh, which um, which is working in the residential solar space, but uses a kind of online uh, platform to. Uh, to take customers and to do its uh, optimization. So, um, but also we were looking right across uh, from materials to different uh, segments of the industry, not just renewables, but other areas as well. And, um, you know, we're happy to work with those companies and, and support them where we can. We have a venture arm uh, and funds to be able to do that as well. That does future solutions will be very important, I think, in meeting things like uh, net zero. Absolutely fantastic to hear that. Thanks, thanks, Susan. Um, conscious of time, we probably have um, time for just one more question, but uh, to all three panelists. So um, it's, um, it's to do with our aggressive targets of, uh, in ASEAN to, to meet the 35% renewable energy uh, installed capacity by 20, 25 and um, um, so I guess it's you know it's an aggressive target. Um, what are our thoughts on uh, you know achieving that with uh, with high penetration of, of, of RE in in Malaysia? We'll start with you, Ken. If that's okay. Uh, so, uh, can you possibly repeat the question? I'm sorry. Yeah. So um, the energy ministers in ASEAN have agreed to set a new target: 35 percent by, by 2025. Uh, um, so uh, the, the question is, you know, uh, it's, it, it's an aggressive target. Are we on track to achieve it in, in Malaysia? Uh, and and you know, well, what are the challenges if there are? Sure. Um, well, I would say across ASEAN, I would be relatively confident because I'm seeing um, governments across ASEAN make quite um, dramatic changes in their energy policy. Um, just last week, I was speaking with the Vietnamese government who are cutting, uh, uh, cancelling an awful lot of their planned coal plants and are positioning themselves to be world leaders on wind power, given the opportunities in that country. And I would say it's a similar position across ASEAN, that as um, solar and wind have fallen in cost, um, ASEAN governments are very focused on competitivity. They, they want to be able to deliver cheap and, uh, and uh, clean energy for their citizens. And so they're investing. Um, here in Malaysia, I mean, I think I'm very um, optimistic about uh, what I've heard today, both from the Deputy Minister and from colleagues from Petronas and elsewhere. It's clear you have a lot of opportunities. It's clear also um, that there is work that needs to be done in terms of um, the grid, in terms of allowing um, battery storage, for example, to be um, used to, to regulate um, flows of, of the electricity. But I'm confident that the solutions are there. And we're hearing from investors. Investors want to invest in, in this sector. And so I think by combining um, the interest from government and the interest from investors and eliminating barriers, I would be competent and that those targets can be met. Okay, thank you. Asman, your, your thoughts, please. Okay, well, well I think uh, it's not impossible. It's definitely possible. It's achievable. I mean, just look at Vietnam. You know, impressive growth in Vietnam is very, very good growth uh, in, in renewables, you know. Uh, nobody could, would think that uh, 
they, they achieve what they have achieved so far. Um, and I, I, I echo what Ken said just now in terms of interest or desires by all the stakeholders, uh, interest by the government, interest by the industry players, interest by operators, and OCs like Petronas. So if, if there's a strong interest and strong support by all the stakeholders, yes, it is possible. It is achievable. Thank you. Jason. Um, you know, I would I would go beyond that. So I think it's uh, both achievable, but we could uh, we could actually go further uh, than that uh, across ASEAN. But I think, as, uh, as some of the other uh, speakers mentioned, including Ken, uh, the the I think the capital is there now. Um, you see companies like ours, but also other oil and gas companies adding to the utilities, adding to the startups, adding to the private equity money the infrastructure money. So capital is there. Um, but often they're chasing the same types of projects in the same countries because those are really bankable ones. Now, the one the areas where they are not bankable is partly because of policy and regulation. So if, if it can be tweaked, those markets can be made more attractive to players, then um, I think we can overachieve uh, those targets because the competitiveness of the of the technologies, the maturity of the technologies, and the advancements that are being made in the enabling technology area, I think only 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 sees higher penetration rather than uh, just the targets that have been uh, there at the moment. Yeah, if I can add, Dr. Leon, uh, just one more point. Finally, is that. The key to success for these countries is that the continuation of policies and consistency of policies. If you look at Vietnam and Thailand, whoever the office holder, it doesn't matter, but the policies continue and they keep uh, you know, going and achieving the targets. That's all I'm saying. Thanks. So I'm conscious of time, uh, apologies to uh, the, the questions that uh, we can't answer. You know, there's, there's, there's quite a few in there that we know given the time we would like to, to address, but I think the, the speakers did a fantastic job uh, on, you know, uh, giving the, the sort of overview on, on the challenges and uh, how we need to work together really to, to, to solve all these uh, issues together. So thank you very much, uh, Ken, As, uh, Asman, and, and Jason for sharing your insights. Uh, it's been absolutely fantastic to hear your your, your thoughts uh, on, on you know, policies, on the, the drivers, on the, uh, the different energy vectors and you know, the challenges we, we all face. Um, so I think we, we're all in agreement and I, I, I like what uh, Ken said in, in the start, uh, clean power is good for public health. And that's uh, you know, what uh, I'm taking away uh, you know, from, from today's uh, session itself. And, uh, I'll end very quickly on, on uh, on, on the words, uh, you know, by His, His Excellency uh, Charles uh, Hayes, the High Commissioner of, uh, of the UK. Uh, he, he mentioned this in, in, in December. Now, it's vital that we work together as part, uh, 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 together as, as a planet for a sustainable future for our children and their children as well. So with that, uh, back to you, Jennifer. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Leong. Very nice closing. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, that brings us to the end of our forum. I, I'm uh, really a wonderful session. Thank you, Ken, for joining us all the way from the UK. Wishing you all the best in your role as on the many initiatives as you bang the drums, you know, working together with many partners, you know, to uh, run up to COP26. Thank you to Jay and Azman for an insightful presentation, facts, and valuable information for many players in the market. So thank you all. But before we close, uh, allow me to share two upcoming programs as part of the BMCC uh, British Highcom Great Sustainable for Future Campaign March webinar series. We'll be having another program on the renewable energy sector, discovering growth opportunities that will be on the 19th of March. Then there will be another one, a bigger, bigger um, forum. We will have speakers from the UN Global Compact, um, um, companies like Sarawak Energy who have signed up for the Race to Energy, uh, Race to Zero campaign, HSBC, Sunway and Siemens talking about 
uh, raised to the net zero, the plan for net zero projects. So with that, um, I hope everyone has uh, had a good session, but please do reach out to us directly if you have any questions or you need any information and support, we are happy to support you, to provide you more information. The name of uh, my contact is there, the contacts of my colleagues who work on, with members in this sector is there too. Please also do keep connected via our digital platforms, our weekly e-newsletter that goes out every Monday, as well as, as well as many information is made available through our social media platforms. So with that, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you to all our speakers once again. Um, you know, they're all members of the chamber. We hope that you found the session insightful. So take care, stay safe and have a, you know, remaining good week, remaining one more day or two more days. So have a good week ahead too. Bye for now.